Hallmark Hotline, what is your emergency? Well, hello and welcome. Becca and I will be hosting Homework Hotline today as Nathan cannot be here. Uh, we can still answer uh, and help you with your math, science, or English questions. Uh, so give us a call at the number listed above, 720-424-1666. So you can watch us on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. on our Comcast channels 22 and our new high definition channel 882. Prism TV channel 8007, Facebook at EG Homework, or Livestream at Livestream.com. Go to Discover and then put DPS TV in the search box. Uh, you can go into our YouTube channel and see past shows, questions, demonstrations, and guests. Um, and you can go to our YouTube channel to see those past shows, questions, demonstrations, and guests. Um, our YouTube channel is Denver DPS TV. So the show is sponsored by our high schools. Uh, I teach at the Contemporary Learning Academy, and Becca teaches at Emily Griffith High School. Today we will have a special guest on in about a half an hour. Aaron LeCount, uh, the uh, Education's Programs Coordinator from Dinosaur Ridge, will be joining us. Okay, so what do you call it when Allosaurus makes a touchdown? <laughs> Tell me, Becca, I don't know. Are you sure? I, I totally don't know. It's called a dino score. <laughs> <laughs> So if you think that joke is lame, or you want help with homework, you can call us, as we mentioned before, or you can tell us over social media. We have Michael here watching our social media. So Michael, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and what you'll be doing here on the show? Well, my name is Michael, and uh, I'm an intern here at DPS. Uh, I'm going to be your social media master today, so I'll be pulling all of your questions from email, Twitter, and Facebook. I'm also the trivia master. Uh, I have a trivia question for you that I'll do here at the beginning of the show, uh, and then I will come back to it at the end. If you know the answer, call us and you'll get some symphony tickets. So the question today is, what was the first dinosaur skeleton found in America? It's a very interesting question. Oh, I wonder if they mean North America and South America, or just... Mm, it's probably the United States, the but United that, States. You know, we have to be careful with that sometimes. Right? I know. You know? So, okay, just got clarification, it's either, so North or South America. North or South America, the Americas. North America, North, North America. America. <laughs> All right. And the U.S., of course. Okay. okay, so just in case. So, if you do have an answer to that question, give us a call. You can call us up there um, before the end of the show. And as Michael mentioned, that uh, we can uh, give you a symphony, symphony tickets to a symphony of your choice. Um, you could also get in touch with us. So here's all of the uh, all of our contact info. So you have some homework tonight. It's stumping you, or just you just aren't feeling it. We're here to help, and these are our contact information. So um, Facebook, it's at eg homework. Twitter at eg homework. Text us at nine seven zero six eight zero thirty seven seventy one, or email us at homework at emilygriffith.edu. We're here to help you. All right, so let's go to Michael and get some of the questions that are waiting for us answered. Thanks, Becca. All right, so we're going to actually start with science question today for you, Sam. Fantastic. True or false, all radioactivity is man-made. Yeah, so false. Uh, most radioactivity, in fact, I, I'm going to go ahead and say all radioactivity is not man-made. Um, human beings can have an impact on uh, how radioactive uh, uh, a substances, um, maybe in an effort to do something like develop, uh, let's say, uh, purified uranium for a nuclear power plant or to develop uh, some type of a core for a uh, nuclear explosive. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about what uh, radioactivity is and then we'll sort of see why I say that really radioactivity is not something that humans create. Um, so, uh, if we could jump to my screen really quickly. Uh, broadly speaking, there are three types of uh, radiation or, or uh, radioactivity that we talk about. Um, there's alpha radiation, beta radiation, and gamma radiation. Now, that's not all types of radiation. What I have in this image right here, as you can see, uh, this over here, this ball of blue and red balls, kind of this, this, this uh, collection of them stuck together, that's meant to represent the nucleus of a uranium atom. So uh, one of the things that we learn about in chemistry or physics is the idea that uh, all substances in the universe are made of 
uh, atoms. And atoms themselves are composed of electrons, neutrons, and protons. And we learned that electrons uh, orbit the, the uh, outer regions of the atom, the space that the atom takes up, and that the very core of the atom is the part that's made up of protons and neutrons. Um, I'm just going to show really quickly the periodic table. This is a, a website called ptable.com. It's a really awesome interactive periodic table website. You can uh, check out all the different uh, known elements that exist, um, all these different elements. You can have an atom of any of these kinds of different elements. So, for example, you could have an atom of hydrogen, where I've got my cursor right now, or you could have an atom of gallium, where I've got my cursor now. Um, and I just wanted to show this to make the point that um, the, the periodic table is set up in such a way that it goes from the smallest elements to the greatest elements, reading from the top left to the bottom right. Uh, so I, I start here at hydrogen. Hydrogen is the smallest and lightest element. And then as we move uh, through over to helium next, helium uh, is the next biggest element. And the numbers that you see here on the top left of the, the uh, element symbol, um, that's what's called the atomic number. And that lets us know uh, how many protons this uh, atom or this element, an atom of this element would have. So a hydrogen atom will always have one proton, a helium atom will always have two protons, uh, an indium atom will always have 49 protons. That atomic number always tells us the number of protons. Um, so I say all this just to make the point that as we go up or as we go through the periodic table, we get to these really large uh, atoms, uh, things like uh, Oh God, here we've got gold gets really big, 79 protons. Um, and then the, probably the most common um, uh, radioactive element that we think of is uranium. So uranium has, has 92 uh, protons in its nucleus. Um, and so let me just jump back to this picture really quick. Really large atoms that have gigantic nuclei, um, nuclei that are filled with tons of protons but also lots of neutrons, um, they tend to be unstable. Um, something that I think is not addressed enough in chemistry and physics classes is the idea that we talk about the idea that, that protons have a positive charge. Um, but then we sort of just gloss over the fact that you could have an area in an atom like a nucleus where two protons, two positively charged particles, sit right next to each other. Even though we learn that positive, two positive charges or two like charges should repel each other. Something that we don't often get into is the idea that there are some special forces that take effect on the very, 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 very small scale of the atomic nucleus. So there are two forces, the strong force and the weak force, and they only act on very, very, very tiny spaces. So for example, the width of the nucleus. So the, the strong force and the weak force are these forces that hold the nuclei of different atoms together. However, there's a limit to these forces, and there's a limit to how much they can, they can hold. And with larger elements, typically, um, we get sort of an instable nucleus, a, a nucleus that's, that's not quite held together well. And so particles of the nucleus can be jettisoned off. And that's what we call radiation. Radiation is, is, I mean, and it comes from the word to radiate, right? Like to let something off. So the idea is, is that the nucleus is letting off different types of particles. Your nucleus might let off the, the, the least damaging type of radiation would be an alpha particle. Uh, alpha particles are identical to helium nuclei. Uh, so it looks just like a helium nucleus. They have two protons, two neutrons. Um, alpha particles are large. And the, 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 an alpha particle could be stopped by a sheet of paper. Like if somebody was shooting alpha particles at me, I just hold up this piece of paper and block those alpha particles with it. Um, beta particles uh, can be stopped by a slightly thicker. Uh, uh, beta particles, excuse me, are electrons that are jettisoned off. You can see here uh, it's represented by this black dot here. Um, uh, typically what happens in, in beta radiation is a neutron is jettisoned off and it breaks down to a proton and an electron. The electron being shot off. Uh, uh, beta radiation is also not uh, particularly damaging. It's slightly more damaging than alpha radiation. The kind of radiation you really want to look out for is gamma radiation, which is a highly charged photon. Um, it's energy that's, it's essentially just an energy particle that's released from the center of the nucleus or from the nucleus itself. Um, gamma radiation, it takes several inches of lead to block gamma radiation. So if you've ever been to maybe the dentist before and had them use, they might do an x-ray of you where they're shooting uh, uh, what are close to gamma rays at you to kind of get a, uh, an x-ray of, let's say, your jaw. If you go into the, the dentist, I've experienced they'll often put an apron over you that's sort of a thick lead apron or lead-filled apron or some kind of an apron that's filled with something that's meant to block um, uh, damaging radioactive uh, particles. Um, so again, radioactivity is just this idea of it's, it's an unstable nucleus of some kind of an atom jettisoning off pieces of itself. And we name those different pieces. You can see here that neutrons are jettisoned off, protons are jettisoned off. There are different situations where different things might be uh, uh, sent off. Um, I just also wanted to make the point that it's not only large molecules 
um, that do that, or large atoms, excuse me, that do this. Um, we can have, uh, typically, smaller atoms are more stable. So carbon's a great example of a pretty stable element. Um, but carbon, um, normal carbon is what we call carbon-12. So you can see that right here on the left side of this image I've just shown, and let me blow this up a little bit. Carbon-12, uh, it's called carbon-12 because it has an atomic weight of 12. We calculate that atomic weight because it has six protons, six neutrons. Each proton or neutron has an atomic mass unit of one or mass value of one. So we add those together and we get a total weight of 12 atomic mass units. That's a typical carbon atom and the vast majority of carbon that exists in the universe is in the form of carbon-12. But in certain situations in the formation of carbon, uh, and, and elements are typically formed inside of stars, uh, it's typically the heat and pressure inside of a star, like our sun, that allows complex elements to be cooked, uh, like carbon. Um, you can have situations where special kinds of carbon are created. Now, all carbon has to have six protons. Uh, the number of protons in an atom always dictates what kind of atom that is. So carbon has got to have six protons, but carbon could have more than six neutrons. In this example, we see carbon-13 and carbon-14, carbon-13 having seven neutrons and carbon-14 having eight neutrons. Carbon-13 and carbon-14 are less stable examples of carbon, and so in fact we do get uh, radioactivity from these forms of carbon, from carbon-14, for example, and we, and we do actually um, radioactive dating using carbon-14. Something I haven't totally gotten into is this idea that uh, radioactivity actually happens at a really consistent rate. Um, radioactivity, uh, atoms break down, they have what's, what's called a, a radioactive half-life, and, and the timing of the radioactivity, the timing that it takes for uh, carbon-14 to break down to carbon-12 is a consistent time. It's a time that we can count on. And I don't know specifically what that is, but we would use that time and we could look at, let's say, um, we could figure out uh, generally how many uh, carbon 13s we would expect to have in a sample, how many carbon 12s we would expect to have in a sample, and then looking at the sample itself and seeing how much carbon 13 and 12 we could make a guess at or a good estimate at uh, how much of the carbon 13 had converted to carbon 12. And that would give us a sense of the time that it took for that to happen, which would be one way that we could date that object. I, I went over that really fast. That's not a great explanation of it, but I just thought I'd add that in there. Generally speaking, radioactivity is just this property of unstable nuclei of atoms. It's not something that people create at all, but of course, human beings have figured out ways to manipulate it. Hmm. Okay, really interesting. Yeah, interesting stuff. <laughs> All right, well, let's go answer more questions. I'm, I know I'm going to have to answer a lot of math questions today, so mm -hmm. oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Geometry questions, I bet. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I, I do control this, so we'll see. It depends on how I'm feeling today. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, so a uh, math question for you is, a cubical block of metal weighs six pounds. How much will another cube of the same metal weigh if it, the sizes are twice as long? Okay, um, I prepared this one a little bit. I drew some cubes. <laughs> Are they um, mate quality cubes? Um, they're they're pretty good. They're pretty all right. <laughs> um, so let's just let's go through that information one more time. Um, one of the uh, a cube is six of uh, some metal is six pounds. So I'm going to make this one six pounds, and then it said. If the sides are twice as long, then uh, what is the weight of the next cube? Um, and so they didn't give any information about the sides, what they were to begin with, but that's okay. We don't necessarily need it. Um, we do just need to know how to actually find the volume um, of this, and then you can assume then that the, uh, the volume is going to be proportionally related to the weight um, if it's the same metal because it's the same metal. Um, so when you are finding the volume, actually I just typed area, I'm gonna say volume um, of um, a cube is gonna be length times width times height. So that's just a rectangular prism in general. Now a cube, one thing that you should know is that cubes have sides where all of their side lengths are all the same. So the length times the width times the height is just going to be, it's all gonna be the same number. So um, the length times three is really what it's going to be. Or sorry, times itself three times, so to the third power. Um, that just means it'll be the length times the length times the length, same number. Um, so, actually let's do it this way. 
let's still call it length times width times height. And then we'll find our volume of the first cube and then we'll find the volume of the second cube. Now, I don't know the side lengths of this, but I do know how they're related to each other, as I mentioned, that they're all the same. So I'm gonna call my width x, my length x, and then my height x as well. So that means that my volume of my cube, um, so I'm gonna say volume of cube one, I'm just gonna use that little tag there this, to say that that is of my first cube. Um, as I mentioned, it's gonna be x times x times x, length times width times height, which simplifies to x cubed. Um, now this one we don't know uh, what the volume is, but we said that the length of the sides is twice as long as our original. So that means two times as long. So I'm gonna do two times x for my length, two times x for my width, and two times x for my height. That means my volume of my second cube is going to be 2x times 2x times 2x, or if we simplify that, we have 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8, and then x cubed. So what you might notice here, I'll highlight these just so you can see what I'm looking at, is the volume of cube one and the volume of cube two, cube two are kind of related. In fact, the volume of cube one or two, this is the same. So the volume of cube two is actually eight times the volume of cube one. So what we can assume then is that because it's the same metal and it has the same density, um, I'm getting into science a little bit here with density and, and whatnot, but we can Fantastic. assume since it has that, um, that the weight is going to be the same or is going to be proportionally related. So because my first cube is six pounds, my second cube, um, the volume's eight times that of the first, so we're going to say that the weight is also eight times um, what the first cube is. So I'm going to take my six pounds, multiply it by eight, because that's the same that the volume does, and we can then assume that the weight of the second cube is going to be 48 pounds. So this is one way to do it. Um, a few other ways pop into mind, but um, I just knew that the volume, if I could find the proportion of the volumes to each other, that the weight would also have the same proportion to each other. So there's, there's my geometry. How'd I do on the geometry? You did fantastic. I really. This is not my forte. I don't even I know why we say. need Nate, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Nate. If you're out there, I'm more of an algebra, <laughs> algebra calc trig. I'll even do. Um, you are an algebra queen. Yeah, that's that's, sure. that's more of mine. So, but I tried. <laughs> All right, Michael. Do we have more questions waiting? I do. Hopefully I, not math. <laughs> no, actually, uh, this is a genetics question. Ooh, but as I look at it, Becca, you know what though? Ooh, I it's know. It's a math I'm question. Need, I'm gonna need your help. Okay. Okay. How does a Punnett like square work? Yeah, Punnett square uh, is a way to predict uh, offspring of two parents, or, or what I should say is it's a way to predict certain characteristics uh, of uh, offspring of, of two parents, two given parents. Um, so, um, Becca, if you could, oh, Becca's already doing it. Becca's setting up a Punnett square for me, fantastic. I'm just gonna give a little bit of background before we jump over and look at what a Punnett square is and how you use it. So. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just going to speak generally, thinking about humans here. I'm going I'm to reference humans specifically. But remember that this is true of, of all different kinds of, of living creatures. There might be some different nuances depending on what type of creature we're talking about. But let's just think about in, in humans, right? Um, all humans uh, are born because uh, they got genetic information from two parents, um, from a mother and a father, right? So uh, as we all know and, and, and probably learned, right, we, what we get is we get uh, the combined genetic material from our father's sperm and our mother's egg. Uh, now, we each have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes in our bodies, and those chromosomes, a chromosome is like a, a, a system of organization for a strand of DNA. And in the nucleus of every single cell in our bodies, uh, we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So in other words, 46 individual chromosomes that contain all of the uh, essentially instructional code for building our bodies. 
really for building the protein in our bodies, but that translates to everything else eventually. Um, so when the sperm and the egg combine, when you get that information from your mom and from your dad, right, the only cells in our body that don't have a total of 46 chromosomes, because remember, we have, we have 23 pairs. The only kinds of cells that we can produce that have fewer than that are sperm and eggs. Sperm and egg cells have 23 chromosomes that are unpaired. So, you know, your dad has 46 chromosomes. Of those 46, each pair, one from each pair is going to be taken and put into a sperm cell. And, and, and which of those two pairs is taken is random depending on the sperm cell. Same goes for your mom. Uh, the egg cell that's developed is just going to have 23 chromosomes, half of the chromosomes that she has, one from each of those 23 pairs. Then when they combine to form the zygote, the, the initial dual cell that will eventually become you, um, that contains, uh, uh, now you have 23 chromosomes, 23 more of the same pairs, and they all combine together to make your 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 total. So the idea is, is that every strand of DNA we have, we have has a, uh, a, like a sister strand of DNA, right? So I've got the, the set of DNA that codes, for example, for my eye color, and I got a, a strand of DNA that has that piece of code, my eye color code. Um, I got a strand of that for my mom and a strand of that for my dad. And how those two codes sort of work together ultimately predicts what my eye color would be. Now, my eyes happen to be blue. They're a little bluish green. Um, and I think about what we do is we look at brown and blue eyes. Um, what, we, what we tend to talk about here is if we've got this gene, so that the part of my DNA that makes eye color, we're going to call that a gene. It's a, it's a set of instructions that code for a specific purpose, for a specific protein, really. But we'll say that there's a specific protein that's going to give me my eye color. So that's the gene that does it. And on, uh, I've, I've got two chromosomes with that gene. One chromosome came from my mom, one came from my dad. Each of those, those two different, what we're going to call those is alleles. And, and the idea is, is that uh, the allele is just the, the one, the, the one I got from my mom or the one I got from my dad. I have two alleles for any given gene. So if we could jump to my screen really quickly. If, uh, not oh, mine. Not, not Wait, Becca's screen, my ready. screen, because Becca is doing it. Oh, Becca, you've already got all set up. You're amazing. Okay. <laughs> so um, here's the idea, right? So um, we get a genetic con uh, contribution from one parent and a genetic contribution from the other parent, one from the mom, one from the dad, right? And you have to remember that the dad himself has two possible things that he could give because the dad had a mom and a dad that gave him a pair of chromosomes. Uh, uh, they contain this gene. The mom also had two possibilities of what she could give because she had two parents. And so th these genes in her body, there's, there's a pair of those genes in her body, two alleles. So what we're looking here for is, is sort of trying to predict, given the characteristics of the parents, what's going to happen with the, the children. So now let's think more specifically about eye color. So in humans, um, we have, oh, and I guess I should say, with these different types of traits, with these alleles, what we tend to have is that one allele will be dominant over another type of the allele. So in the case of the allele, the gene that produces eye color, brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. And what that means is, is that as if we had uh, parents with brown eyes mating together, it would be very likely to get a child with brown eyes. And if we had a, a parent with, a br with brown eyes and, a, and another parent with blue eyes and they mated together, the genetics that contribute to the brown eyes would likely cover up the genetics that contribute to the blue eyes. Let's look at that a little more specifically. So if we could jump to Becca's screen. You can tell me if I'm wrong on anything. No, I, I saw it for just a second and it looked perfect. So once we get it up, <laughs> we'll see if it actually beautiful. Oh my God. So wonderful. <laughs> so um, actually, okay, so the only thing, Becca, is what you're what you're looking at there is actually the genotype. Genotype. Crap. So well, so okay, actually so, I should, no, the, no, the, the left side is on the that's right. That's right. The left side is the genotype, so the, the right side is the here's genotype. Here's my this is right. Okay, gonna, so this is my that's phenotype. phenotype. Okay, good. And then these good are the genotypes. Okay, great. So, and while well, Becca's putting that in, I'm just going to explain. So, um, we can classify you in two ways. We can talk about your genotype, which refers to, okay, what actually, which two alleles do you have for that gene? That's your genotype. And then we could talk about your phenotype, and that's like, what do you actually look like? How, right? does, it, how does it express itself? How does, how does it, it express itself? Exactly. Do you have brown eyes? Do you have blue eyes? I have blue eyes, so that's my phenotype. Becca, are you brown eyed? Um, I'm hazel. Hazel eyed? Okay. So. What does that count? What does that? Why are you laughing wanna, at me? I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> minimize the hazel it's quality like of your eyes. Like greenish brown. We're right. gonna go with. We're gonna go with. Becca has brown eyes. I have oh. blue eyes. I have brown I, eyes. Look, mine are aquamarine. Okay. I just don't want to <laughs> complicate things. Okay. So Becca's are hazel. Mine are aquamarine. But technically speaking, uh, hers are brown. Mine are mine are blue. Um, They're hazel. I have the recessive trait. Uh, Becca has the dominant trait. Right. 
So um, let's imagine here, uh, let's, let's take a mom. Let's say, should the mom have blue eyes? Mama should have blue eyes. Let's give the mom blue eyes. So let's say that the mom has blue eyes. The oh, only that way that the mom can have blue eyes is if both of her alleles are the recessive blue trait. If she has, and, and we're going to represent those by two little Bs. And I should just say, in the genotype, we represent the different uh, alleles or the different possibilities of alleles through a, a big letter, small letter combination. Big letter being the dominant trait, small letter being what we call the recessive trait. So dominant is always going to be out uh, uh, recessive. But in the case of the mom here, she's got, uh, from her parents, she got both recessive traits, both codes for blue eyes, and that allowed her eyes to turn out blue. Now, let's say the dad is... He's brown-eyed, but brown he has eyed, a blue allele. That, perfect. I love it. So, dad is, is, has brown eyes. His phenotype is a, is a brown-eyed person, but his genotype is dominant recessive, what we would call heterozygous. Um, so, we would call mom homozygous recessive because... Homozygous, again, zygous refers to that idea of zygote, that original combination of the two, uh, of the, the genes for mom, genes from dad. And she's homozygous because homo means the same, and she's got both the same genes, recessive, recessive. So we call her homozygous recessive. If we had a person that was big B, big B, dominant trait, dominant trait, they would be homozygous dominant. But Papa here, the dad, uh, has... Did I get it right? Uh, just heterozygous. Because heterozygous implies that you've got mixed, and it's not dominant or recessive, it's both, right? Okay. So just, sorry, Becca. Just heterozygous. I'm just, I'm just, you're, doing, you're doing so good. It should be noted, right? Becca is a math teacher, and she is killing it here. I'm just uh, remembering this from science. biology back in high school. This is like That's a long time ago. right? Okay, so. But so, I liked it. Awesome. So the idea is, is that as we combine the two possibilities from dad and the two possibilities from mom, we're left with four total possibilities that we could have in our offspring. And so we set up the Punnett square in this way because it allows us to clearly lay out, okay, what are the possibilities that we could get? In the top right corner, dad can contribute a dominant brown-eyed Top allele. right? Top, oh, sorry, I, said, I meant top left. Okay, I, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm doing lots of things Dad's right giving big B. Dad's going to provide big B, and mom is going to provide little b. And so in this case, there is a, and, and what I should also say is, the four squares represent 100% of all possibilities of children that mom and dad could have. So each individual square represents 25% probability of what the child could be. So there is a 25% chance we're going to end up with a heterozygous, a, a, a child with a, a genotype, which is heterozygous, and a phenotype, brown eyes. Because the large B should overtake the little blue B, the large brown B. Are we cool so far? Yes. In the top right-hand corner, oh, that look back is so good at this. <laughs> uh, in the top right-hand corner, Dad again is going to contribute a uh, big large big B, a dominant brown eye allele, and then Mom is going to contribute the little recessive blue eye allele. Once again, the large brown eye allele, the dominant trait, wins out. So we have a heterozygous genotype, right inside of the child. Their genes are mixed; they have one dominant, one recessive. But what we see. The, what we ultimately see uh, uh, represented is a brown-eyed person. Okay. And they could have blue-eyed kids, too, because it's like they're, they're just like Papa. Oh, that's a great point. <laughs> they're just like Papa, and, and Papa's capable of having blue-eyed kids, which we're about to see. So in the bottom left box, um, Mama is going to contribute a little B, but so is Dad. And so we get both recessive. So this would be my case, right? Both of my parents contributed uh, the recessive gene for blue eyes. And I ended up with blue eyes. There's Do a, they both have blue eyes? No, my mom has blue eyes. My dad has brown eyes. So this oh, actually, this, this is, is this could be this like my parents. And you know what? Sam. Even as I'm thinking about it, that is true. So I'm like, I, I am blue eyed. And let, let's just finish this, and we'll, because because my brother actually. Well, let's just keep going. So the, the bottom right hand corner. Wow. Bottom right hand corner there is going to be again. Dad is going to contribute uh, little b. Mom is going to contribute little b. We've got. Uh, two recessive traits, they're going to work together to create blue eyes. So we have what I would call a homozygous recessive genotype, and the phenotype is blue eyes. So you essentially have a 50% chance of getting both. Yeah, perfectly said, Michael. So we have 50% chance of brown eyes, 50% chance of blue eyes, and you know, just to tie this together, I didn't even intend this to be the case, but I have blue eyes, uh, my father has brown eyes, my mom has blue eyes, he must be heterozygous, my father. Uh, my brother has brown eyes. And oh. I have blue eyes. So that so there really was. I mean my my parents had What's two kids. What's your brother's kids. name? My brother's name is Tom. Tom. Sam and Tom. 
right? So, and, and it could have turned out a different way. You know, it just, just they could have had two brown-eyed children. They could have had two blue-eyed children. It's really just probability, right? Uh, uh, what's possible here? What possible combinations? What would we expect? But, you know, my, we worked out pretty statistically perfectly. We got 50% of the children brown-eyed, 50% of the children blue-eyed, right? Yeah. So this is how a Punnett square works. Um, there are levels of complication you can add to it. And certainly as you get into thinking about how complex DNA is, you understand that, you know, predicting these traits can be fairly complex as we look at real living organisms. But when we boil it down to just one trait, blue eyes, or you'll often see in science class, they'll look at the color of flower petals, like are you going to produce white flowers or purple, or purple flowers, yeah. right? Th those are sort of classic examples. And it's really cool to see that there is, there is uh, in the case of the flowers, sometimes what you'll do in class, you'll grow a lot of pea plants and actually see, hey, did we get the numbers that we expected yeah. based on the parentage? Here. Um, the example of me and my brother doesn't provide a lot of data, but it's a good example, I think, that shows that, you know, these things tend to fall out into these proportions. It's also kind of cool because you could figure out um, that your dad was must have been heterozygous, heterozygous based on kind of that fact. Yeah, like, and a thing that I had literally never thought do of before. A blood I, test on I, I, I have thought about blue eye, brown eye, recessive dominant traits fairly frequently, and I teach this regularly, but I never stop to think, wait, I have blue eyes. My brother has brown eyes, my mom has blue eyes, my dad has brown eyes, like what must have been the combination. And it's kind of cool because just from observing that stuff, the stuff that I can see, I can make a pretty accurate prediction about what's going on in my parents' DNA. That's amazing. That is pretty cool. I like these. I think they're fun. Cool. Well, thanks for the help there, Becca. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take a little break. And when we get back, we are going to be meeting with Erin LeCount from, um, from Dinosaur Ridge. She's the Education Programs Coordinator. So we'll talk to her in just a minute. Hi, we're here with Erin LeCount from Dinosaur Ridge. Um, could you just tell us your job title and tell us what you do for Dinosaur Ridge first? Sure, I'm the Education Programs Coordinator there. I coordinate programs with schools, daycares, senior centers, anyone that come, wants to come out for a tour. Um, I also run summer camp programs, pretty much anything having to do with education there, I get to oversee. So Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Tell us a little bit about Dinosaur Ridge yeah, for people definitely. who don't know what Dinosaur Ridge is. Sure. Um, we are an outdoor dinosaur museum and geology museum west of Denver um, at C470 West Alameda. <coughs> way. So we're only 30 minutes away from Denver. We're not that far away. A lot of people think that we're out in the mountains somewhere. We have to hike seven miles to get to us. It's like, no, it's a road. It just drives right yeah. up to it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we have a visitor center there on the east side, and we also have a visitor center there on the um, west side. Uh, at Red Rocks Park entrance number one mm -hmm. um, and the Alameda road cut that goes up and over Dinosaur Ridge um, that's where all of our fossils and locations are where all the signs are you can go up and you can do a hike you can do a guided tour you can um, do all sorts of fun stuff there we've got dig areas for kids and we have special programs throughout the summer so, so it's it's there's an actual museum or or building where you you keep fossils and such like such yeah and you were mentioning earlier um, are a lot of the fossils in the ground? I've never been, so this is yeah. why my question sounds oh, that's so silly. Okay. That's but, fine. Um, no, you're good. Um, are a lot of the fossils still in the ground, or how does how is how is that? Did you yeah, dig them all up, or uh, no? Actually, um, we we haven't ever actually dug us friends of Dinosaur Ridge has never dug anything out of Dinosaur Ridge. Um, hmm. It's a protected site. It's a natural okay. national okay. landmark. And um, basically, we're just the keepers of the fossils. Um, we have over 300 footprints um, about from made by about 37 different individual animals, um, all in the same layer. It's a massive slope. Kind of looks like Dinosaur National Monument with tracks mm -hmm. instead of bones. Uh, and we tend to see um, more footprints around it. You can go in different areas. Um, we also have amazing areas of, of ripple marks from where the waves were washing up because we used to be an ocean right, right on the coast of an ocean. And uh, we also have dinosaur bones, a couple dozen dinosaur bones still in the rock. All of these are still where they were laid down 150 to 100 million years ago. Wow. Um, we do have indoor exhibits that also contain um, replicas, things, things like these, um, but also uh, some real fossils in that, that are local, locally collected in the area. So. Um, by other museums or, or by, um, if they fall down, we have someone come out and collect them so we can put them on display. Awesome. Very cool. You know, I got to go as a geology student in college when I was a junior. I went up to Dinosaur Ridge as part of the, mm -hmm. the program. It was awesome. And I still remember uh, one particular slab of rock that had just fantastic footprints in it. And I was thinking, you know, I, 
talk to my students sometimes about the idea that, hey, we live in a state that is just so rich with, you know, all kinds of geologic and paleontological mm -hmm. history. But specifically dinosaurs, if you're into dinosaurs, there's all kinds of stuff all over the state. But uh, could you maybe talk a little about why is it that we have dinosaur fossils here in Colorado? Like, why does that even happen? And what was the environment like for them in, you know, proto-Colorado way back in the day? Right, back in the day. Um, the neat thing about Colorado is that the way the mountains rose here kind of allows us, it didn't just smash everything when they came up. Sure, the Rocky Mountains rose pretty quickly in terms of a mountain range, right? right? I mean, 30 million years right. isn't quick, but geologically, that's pretty fast. Uh, but what it did is, it, is, as it rose, it basically took the flat layers that were there, kind of like a giant stack of pancakes, um, and, and broke them up and split them out and pushed them side, out to the side. So if you go to Grand Junction on the other side of the mountains, you can see these same exact layers that we see here. They're just tilted the other way. And in fact, Dinosaur mm -hmm. National Park yeah. is on the opposite side. It's on the, the opposite slope, that the part that opened slope. up on the other side of Colorado. Right, and, so, and it's the same layers. You're looking right, at the same right. layers there. Dinosaur National Monument in Vernal, Utah, um, that has all the gorgeous dinosaur bones and, and thousands and thousands upon thousands of dinosaur bones, where on our side, we have dinosaur bones as well from the same era the, from the Jurassic period, same dinos, um, and we also end up having on the opposite side tracks. The nice thing about Dinosaur Ridge is that it used to be flat, oldest on the bottom, youngest on the top, and you know our dinosaur bones are our oldest, so they're on the bottom technically. When the mountains rose, about started rising about 70 million years ago, so dinosaurs didn't hike the mountains, um, <laughs> but they surfed, which is cool. Right. So uh, what happened is as the mountains rose, it took Dinosaur Ridge and kind of tilted it up sideways and put it on its edge, which let us access the dinosaur bones that would technically be 400, 500 feet below the surface. If it hadn't tilted it due to the mountain uplift, we wouldn't be able to see them. All we'd maybe see is the tracks if they hadn't already eroded away. It's a hard sandstone, so it doesn't want to go away very easily. It's a tough rock. Um, but because of that uplift that occurred all along the front range of the Rocky Mountains, um, on both sides of the Rocky Mountains, which happened to go right through the middle of us, we get a chance to find all these awesome dinosaur locations, and not just dino locations, other stuff too. I'm sure you guys are familiar with Snowmass. Um, mm -hmm. Other locations that um, were just kind of perfect for the uplift, the layering, and the right age to be exposed. Um, and that's kind of why we find so many, not just dinosaurs, but that's why we find mostly a lot of dinosaurs here in Colorado, just because the layer, the right layers popped up at the right time. Luckily, they had stuff in them. It feels so fortunate, you know, just I like know. so. Like, what are the chances? Right. But it also makes you think, kind of, what must be buried under the ground that we haven't seen yet? That we haven't seen, yeah. <laughs> Every kid wants to dig up their backyard. I am like, sure, especially oh, after they come to the know, Dinosaur Ridge. Yeah, I know, they do, oh and they're gosh. like, I'm going to go dig up my yard. And I'm like, oh, I can't really encourage that. Please don't dig up your yard. Well, so speaking of kids, so what uh, what kind of tours do you offer for students, for young kids, for families? What do people do when they come to Dinosaur Ridge? Uh, we offer a little bit of everything. You can come and do a tour with your family if you'd like. We've got um, $8 tours that also include a trip through our indoor museum. Uh, you can... Um, come out with a school group. Teachers can sign up with me for school for school uh, programs. We've got scholarships for low-income schools. We've also got uh, uh, five different programs that you can pick, and we can tailor our program to be what you're doing in the classroom. If you want more of a geology focus, because that's what you're focusing on, we can do that. If you want more of a fossil focus or geologic time focus, we can do that. If you want more of an ecology focus, we can do that, because you're looking at direct evidence of Colorado when it was <coughs> uh, kind of like the Serengeti. 150 million years ago or 100 million years ago when we were Florida essentially mm -hmm. so you can really see the fossils um, and the plants and the landscapes and how they changed over time so if you're doing a climate focus we can focus on that um, we've got programs for little kids if you have the the preschool through second graders that aren't going to do very well on a one and a half hour lecture based tour <laughs> um, <laughs> Even some high schoolers don't do well on that one, <laughs> yeah. uh, or adults. <laughs> but uh, we have some more hands-on programs. We have a couple dig areas where kids get to go in and look at the replica dinosaur bones, uncover them, and then try and figure out the story of the dinosaur. Works really great for those little kids. Um, we do a little bit of everything in between. We have senior centers come out. We do uh, tours that's for, awesome. for everyone. Yeah. That's really, that's just so fantastic. Oh, that's really cool. When do you think, what would be the best time of year to go visit? Like, you know, maybe not the best when it's super cold? Yeah, like yesterday, no. Not the best Not time. the best day to come visit. <laughs> um, anytime that our fossils are exposed is, is really good. Um, people tend to try and put it off until spring and summer, um, which is great. Then that's absolutely fine. You can do that. There are a ton of really awesome days, January, February, March, yeah. 
75 degrees. Come on out. Mm -hmm. There's not many people there. Most people are too afraid to come out in the, in the winter or in, you know, late fall because they're like, ah, oh, but the weather might be bad. It's like, right. well, we're not. And mountains. they think that we're in Vail, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're, we're a hop, skip, and a jump. We're that first. The, I always describe us as that little hill in your way when you're trying to get to Red Rocks. Mm -hmm. That's us. Yeah, um, everybody's past dinosaur. That's us, <laughs> yeah. Everyone's past dinosaur ridge, but not many people realize that that is what it is. And, yeah, it's gorgeous. You can come see us pretty much any time of the year as long as it's kind of sunny. If there's a foot of snow, you can come. You'll have a nice walk. You'll go on a nice hike. You mm -hmm. might not see the tracks because right. they're, mm -hmm. they're under there, I promise. <laughs> but um, it's going to be tough to, to see it if there's bad weather. So mm. pretty much any time. I'm gonna have to get back out there soon. It's been too long for me. I pass it off and when I go to Red Rocks, we'll be like, oh, right. go back to oh, there. there. Yeah. I'm gonna really need to go. I, I'm gonna definitely be there. F fantastic. Would you tell us a little bit about yeah. um, what you've brought with us? Sure. Um, we've got some Colorado locals, some natives. Uh, awesome. I brought, I brought oh, to right. hang out with you guys. They're more native um, than, than we are. That's right. True. They're the original natives. Mm -hmm. um, the they're, the, they're the hipster natives of Colorado. Right. <laughs> uh, we've <laughs> got uh, Triceratops is the classic. This is the forehead oh. of a Triceratops. Oh, we call these so cool. the brow play, horns. Like, yeah, play with it. That's, that's absolutely. Amazing. They're replicas, so they're nice and light. Um, we typically make it's replicas. Huge. As you can see, this one has been what I call loved. Uh -huh. by children yes well, um well loved no doubt. and gravity <laughs> oh yeah back up the yeah exactly <laughs> what, what, um, these, what is this made is this plaster it's kind of like a resin a it's resin? like a plastic sure yeah it's pretty durable pretty nice. stable well, this is great i could wear this on my um, head yeah that's no lightweight you, i've weight. been thinking of mounting them on the hood of my car oh and yeah having, that like, would be way cool i yeah. like that that's a great idea you um, get in your way <laughs> right out. exactly Especially if you have a tiny car like I do, oh, it would be hilarious. Um, but Triceratops really is, an, is a local. It was first found at um, 13th and Federal. Um, they found <laughs> a set of, <laughs> of brow horns. 13th and Federal. 13th and Federal, yeah, when they were, when they were building streets in Denver in 1887. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know what it was. They'd never seen it before. Um, mm. All they found was this part. So they assumed a type of ancient bison. So the very first Triceratops name bison. was actually Bison Alticornis. And they didn't know what it was until... A few years later, up in Wyoming, they found the whole skull, and they went, oh. And that's, that's just bison right high crown. But yeah, that's yeah. exactly. And that's so they ended up calling it Triceratops, which means three-horned face. Dinosaur names sound really cool, but when you actually break them down into their Greek <laughs> or Latin, simple. it's super simple, like right. three-horned face Triceratops. Um, oh. And then T-Rex, of course, eating yes. Triceratops. This is a T-Rex tooth. That's the crown of the tooth. The root would have been just as long uh -huh. in there. They had very deep rooted teeth because um, they're, they're biting through animals just the same size as them. Mm -hmm. uh, also a local, the first evidence of, of T-Rex in Colorado is South Table Mountain, 1874. Okay. They found a tooth just like that. Didn't know what it was, thought it was a horn. Um, yeah, well, because T-Rex wasn't actually found and named until 1905. So uh, they were just confused. I mean, how could that be a tooth? It's huge. That's so cool. Yeah. You know, you mentioned <laughs> that they found the Triceratops horns or crown when they were building a road, essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. and I was going to mention, so my, my roommate is actually a paleontologist. Oh, cool. And her job is she goes out to build sites, dig sites, and mm -hmm. it's, it's so often building a road. Yeah. And she just has to stand there while people are, you know, pulling earth out and yeah. rock out. And she's just waiting for something to pop up to help identify it. And I think it's so interesting. It's like maybe we think that, oh, you know, somebody goes out and thinks, oh, I'm going to find a dinosaur here. Right. But it's much more often incidental. It's just... We oh, had to dig up the ground and we ran into this big thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. typically. Um, just like, like the discovery at Snowmass, you know, they were building, uh, rebuilding the parts of the reservoir and they hit a, a tusk off of a skull from a, a mastodon with a bulldozer. And it was, oh, cool, look at that. I wonder what else is here. They you also know? found Incredible. Uh, uh, triceratops bones at the Coors Field mm -hmm. site. That's why Dinger is the mascot of the Rockies. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Oh, yeah. okay. You can, they have those over at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We're working on doing a Dinger Day this year as an event at Dino Ridge. We're trying to get oh, the bones. Cool. Um, they're, they're what we would call scant material. Yeah. It's, it's as they identify, it's unidentifiable ceratopsian, which just means some kind of horned dinosaur. Of course, we label it Triceratops. is the most common one here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and we find other bones not too far away that are identifiable as Triceratops. Um, arguably the most important dinosaur to Colorado. This is gonna, subjective, I'm saying that, mm -hmm. because it's my favorite dinosaur, mm -hmm. and that's uh, Stegosaurus. Right. Stegosaurus uh. being our state fossil. Oh, is that a fin? This is one of the, yeah, one of the plates on the oh. back. This is the very last plate oh on the back of the tail, right before those really cool spikes, wow. right on the back of the tail. <laughs> so some of them could get, I mean, this is one of the smaller of the plates on no the back. Kidding. Some of them could be 
this tall. They're huge. Um, plates on the very high part of the back. Colorado State Fossil, super weird dinosaur. Um, they did have keratin over the plates because um, you see actually you can actually see their blood vessels on the sides yeah. of the bone oh. um, being that they're on the outside this? of the bone that's not usually where you should have your blood on the outside of anything um, so there's keratin on the outside of that so, that, so or is yeah. that mm -hmm. those yeah those grooves there images? and do we have a good names. understanding of why stegosaurus had the plates on their back it's, it's i've good. heard different things but it sounds like yeah. there's not a consensus right no there's not i mean typically if you're going to break it down biologically mm -hmm. and how i i always teach it depending on the age i'm teaching at mm -hmm. um <coughs> you do things for a couple of reasons one you know you've got obviously defense or identification Right? You totally. want to look big and scare something off, or look big and look pretty. Because yep. um, the other thing that it's, it's either food or sex with animals. Right, right. Really, that's it. Right. Protection um, or peacock style. Yeah, right? protection mm -hmm. or peacock. Now, having those big plates all along its back, not so great for protection. They're what we call osteoderms. Osteo meaning bone, derm meaning skin. So they're actually just embedded in the skin. They're not attached to the spine at all. So it's kind of like having a big bony fingernail that can just get ripped off and leave a giant gaping wound and it'll get infection and you'll die. Uh, not great armor, especially since it didn't cover 90% right, 90, 90 right. of the body. Um, but really great for being tall, looking pretty. Um, and with the blood vessels in there being covered by keratin or what we think would be keratin over the top, fingernail stuff, you can always pump blood in there and have the blood circulate around. And if you stand, with your body into a breeze, that the breeze would actually cool the blood and circulate it. Mm -hmm. um, so it is kind of like an air conditioner, kind of like a heater. You can turn into the sun and warm up say, a little bit. That's mm -hmm. what I heard was that they use them, that they would warm Thermo themselves in the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That that's so that cool that they could also cool themselves down in the same right. way. Yeah, what same a genius way. thought, like if you just had a little bit of your blood mm -hmm. pass over a large surface area and cool right. that part of the blood down, that'll cool your internal body temperature down. Right. And the question always was, well, if they're warm blooded, why would they need that? Because they can just regulate. Well, I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're warm blooded, but you're not as warm blooded as we are right. you're also 35 feet long and you're standing a good 12 12 and a half feet tall with those plates on your back you've got a lot of square footage of skin that you might need to cool down a little bit more rapidly than if you could do it yourself especially since they lived here in Colorado when it was kind of like north central Africa very dry kind of flood plainy mm -hmm. um, Serengeti without any grass because grass wasn't around yet uh, so you're gonna see um, things like that with animals that live there today. If you look at African elephants, they have those huge ears and this, yeah. they're just filled with blood vessels because mm. despite the fact that they're mammals, they're warm-blooded, they flap their ears a lot right. because moving air over the blood vessels in their ears and circulating it through their body cools them down. Yeah. And we can see that with, with these as well. Um, well, even dogs, like, right? Dogs mm -hmm. use dogs pant. You know? pant it seems yep. like the yeah. most inefficient system ever, but it seems to yeah. work. It out, works right? for them. <laughs> so yeah, fun, fun things with comparing things from the modern day and things of the past, just yeah. being able to look into how do these animals live and, and, and because, I mean, we, and pending time machines, you can't go back there and take a, take a peek. Uh, but you get a chance to look and do comparisons with modern day. I mean, they always say the present is the key to the past, right? So we uh, end up looking at all Did the animals we have. Did you say that yesterday? Have. I might have said that yesterday. Nice, <laughs> nice. You always got to name drop that. That's, <laughs> a, that's a good one. It's a classic. Yeah, yeah, it's a classic. Oh, that's awesome. And oh, I, that's really I'm reading great. here, Stegosaurus is our Colorado State fossil. Yeah. That's awesome. Why, why is, is there a reason for that? Uh, a bunch of fourth graders, I believe in the mid-90s, late 90s. Oh, yeah. um, Colorado didn't have a state fossil. Um, and there were a few other states that did at the time. So they were like, well, why not go with a local? The very first Stegosaurus that was ever dug up was found at Dinosaur Ridge in 1887. The, very, the Stegosaurus that named all other Stegosaurus wow. is the first uh. be-all, end-all. And you can actually go up onto Dinosaur Ridge and touch the bones that are left of the first, world's first Stegosaurus, which is cool. And so they picked Stegosaurus because it's a local. It was found locally. The bones are on display um, at Dinosaur Ridge, and the material that they removed in the 1800s back at Yale has actually, a lot of it has come home to live at the Morrison Natural History Museum. So oh, that, all the bones are on display. You can go see them. Um, so they picked it and they petitioned the governor and, and it was picked right after that as our state fossil. So a bunch of nosy fourth graders got us that one. Oh, so. Good. Well, good for nosy That's fourth graders. Yeah. I know. Good for nosy <laughs> fourth graders. That's super awesome. It makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. So it's a good one to pick. Honestly. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Well, um, gosh, I'm really fascinated by this, but we do have to You're good. say goodbye. But this, this has been really wonderful. Thank you for joining us on the show and sharing all of the information about Dinosaur Ridge and just what you do and and all of the opportunities that are available at Dinosaur Ridge, by the way. 
Um, so thank you guys for, for uh, taking a listen and check out Dinosaur Ridge whenever you get a chance. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a minute just to answer more of your homework questions. Hi, welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed that as much as we did. We had, we had trouble um, saying up. goodbye yeah. because we, we were so interested and had so many more questions. Yeah. So um, really, really awesome. If you guys, I, I grew up where this was not not even an option even right? an option and i was so into dinosaurs mm -hmm. and i just like the fact that it's around here you gotta visit yeah, if you're a little you kid really into dinosaurs visit. you couldn't be luckier than to live in a place I like know. colorado what in the world and it really is a cool place it's and she didn't get a chance did not get a chance to show us um this trace fossil of a footprint uh, but that's what dinosaur ridge is all about so if you so go out cool. there you'll get a chance to see those so. absolutely super cool strong recommend all right, well, uh, let's go. Uh, we're going to give you our, our trivia question one more time just to give you a chance to answer it if you are just joining us. Michael, what is that trivia question? So the trivia question is, what was the first dinosaur skeleton found in North America? Oh, wow. I guess we now know yes. the first skeleton found in Colorado. Well, yes, we do. Because Aaron just told us, but we don't know if yes, that's the do. one that was the first one found in America. Yeah, we don't. But you can call in and guess it. For sure. Um, you got a couple minutes, so hurry up. It numbers right up there. Give us a call. Um, in the meantime, we're going to try and answer um, a question. Well, can we can we eat our fossil? Can, can we, we eat show our fossil? everybody our fossil? Let's do that. that. You guys didn't get to see our fossil from yesterday. So yesterday, we created this <laughs> ancient landscape. You can see. See the little uh, dinosaurs in there. Yeah, you can actually see some here. Dinosaurs I can hold it up. Over I think. here, they got embedded. Oh, here, Becca's okay. going to do a better job than me. I well, I think they just have a. Oh, they've got the close-up close up set up. Cam. Up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, no, I oh, know. <laughs> Layers of chocolate. I lost a boulder. So this is it. Folks. All right. So we put a whole bunch of stuff in there, and I'm going to break this up for us a little bit, do a little bit of uh, excavating, excavating. Here, a little bit of paleontology. Culinary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then, Becca, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, oh, oh, God. In theory, I'm going to give you a little piece of crust. And then, Becca, you're allowed to eat it. Yes. So you also have to look for fossils in it. While oh, I'm you totally going to look for fossils. If I can just. <laughs> if we can. <laughs> okay, Becca. I will try not to eat the plastic dinosaurs. I there. know you're not going to eat this whole thing. Oh, my thing. gosh. I'm going to eat the whole thing. <laughs> oh, just yummy. Just get started with that. Here, you can set it right here okay. on that. And I'll do another mm, one over just... here. And Becca and I are each going to see if we can unearth. <laughs> Any example of a fossil that we could look at? Oh, the peanut butter did not work out super well. <laughs> That's tasty. <laughs> okay, let's see. Earthworm. Yeah, the earthworms probably created the best mold fossils. So I've got right here, maybe you can come back to me on that close up. Oh. 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 <laughs> I'm just maybe <laughs> you can come right here where my finger's pointing. I don't know. But I have uh, just a very uh, kind of light you can see in there. I don't know if you can see these ridges. You probably can. And those ridges right there, that is a mold fossil uh, from the uh, what we were calling titanoboas yesterday, but what were actually just gummy worms. Titanoboas. Right? They're delicious. <laughs> they're, they're really good. Um, and yeah, I'm having a hard time getting any other. Oh, here's, my, here's a dinosaur. Here we go. I might Let's have see if one. I can excavate. <laughs> oh, yeah. These are here. I got one. It's like I want to eat it, but I also want to see fossils. I don't know which, which thing I care one. about more. Oh, there's a good mold fossil. See? Mm -hmm. Titan what are they called? Titana? Titana boa. Like a boa. Titana boa, yeah. Yeah. There it is. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> we I was it. having a lot of fun with this, but <laughs> we should give you the answer to the trivia okay. question. So, Michael. <laughs> so, the answer to the trivia question, what was the first dinosaur skeleton found in America, is the Hydrosaurus folkii, uh, which was found in Haydenfield, New Jersey in 1858. Uh, it's discovered uh, to be in the Mesozoic, or the middle period, uh, of the three periods of the Triassic, uh, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period. Uh, it's believed to be a meat-eating uh, dinosaur, no, uh, meaning beast-footed. Hydro. Oh. Theropod, that's what it was, meaning beast-footed. I want to look at a picture real quick. I'm going to pull up a hadrosaurus. Yes. Full, mm. what, how do you say it? Full, full you know, I had oh. to listen to it, and then we asked our expert as well. Okay, I'm going to show you this really fast, and then I'm going to have to say goodbye to you. Fantastic. But I just think this is a good way to end. Um, mm. Ancient Earth Day. Here so we go. Go to, my, go to my screen real fast. Here's, here's the guy. That's him. Mm -hmm. That's him. All right, well, got to say goodbye. We really enjoyed this week, Dinosaur Week. 
Um, we'll have some more fun stuff for you next week. Join us again, 4.30 to 5.30. Thanks again. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs>